idea of not speaking uh, to keep that noble silence is so you don't have to disturb other people. You can imagine what it would have been like if the Buddha would have been famous under the Bodhi tree. He might have just been getting into the deep meditations and somebody just asked him, Excuse me, I have a question. Can you please answer it? It's nice to keep things quiet during a meditation retreat so people can go inside. That's one of the reasons why we have the noble silence. And for somebody who has lived in forest monasteries and in caves, the silence is just so beautiful, so profound, and so joyful. It's nothing scary, but it's just totally uh, inspiring. And in the silence, you can see much more deeply and understand so much more. It's one of the reasons why you can try it for yourself. That we did, uh oh, oh. He's doing this. Must be allowed to tell something wrong. He wants to. That's what it means to kill somebody. <laughs> no, I think my head's been chopped off by the camera. <laughs> but anyway, the silence is beautiful. So keep that silence when you possibly can. The noble silence, though, does not mean you don't talk at all. If somebody wants to find out the way to the toilet or something, you don't just. <laughs> Please let them know exactly, because they told us over there. The best thing with noble silence is that you don't go into conversations. So you can just give the, the helpful instructions. And the other thing with noble silence, it is kind of a shame that you all are wearing masks, because even though you have noble silence, it doesn't mean you can't smile at each other to make people realize that you're well loved and cared for. You don't get so miserable when no one says anything and they don't even smile. So, uh, if you can at least smile with your eyes. So that means that people know that they're well cared for. But number two is that when you have noble silence, please understand that if you, know, you go along and you tell other people to be quiet, then you're also destroying the noble silence. So if somebody else is speaking and they're disturbing the peace, uh, in Australia we always say to give people the one finger sign. You know the one finger sign? That's right, this one. <laughs> Not the other one. <laughs> We're very fine. So you can always go shh, and that is fine. That's not distort, disturbing the noble silence. And that also means you just create a good atmosphere of silence. In this, especially in this room over here. So when this room uh, has that noble silence and people start getting into reasonably good meditation, the energy of the room changes. And I've noticed that many, 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 many times. A good example is the hall in Bodhinyana Monastery, which we built about 37 years ago. And now, if you go into that hall, it's got incredibly peaceful energy. And many of you who have gone on retreats over in Jhana Grove, I sometimes encourage you just to walk the short distance over to Bodhinyana Monastery. Go and sit in that hall and you'll experience just how easy it is to meditate there. The energy of stillness, we've got some Buddha relics in there as well, that energy permeates, especially the front of that hall. And people get much deeper meditation there than many other places. It's as if, after a while, we build up the energy of peace and silence and stillness. And it means that many other people have great meditations there as well. And I even recall so many times one incident which comes up that even just some of these rough Australian workers, there's a gentleman who built our concrete water tanks all by himself. He was a very strong man, very rough, very kind, but his speech was just, well, he couldn't stop speaking. And so at the end of his job, the contract, he asked me, you know, he called me Brahm, and I said, Brahm, is it okay if I come and look in your church? That's our meditation hall. He didn't know what a meditation hall was. He said, yes, come in. 
but he was wearing boots, and the boots were all caked with cement and concrete. And instead of taking them off, I said, look, you don't need to take them off. Just I'll open the door. You can put your head around the hall, around the door, sorry. Put your head in the hall, and just you can see for yourself. And that's what he did. But I recall so amazingly, he was talking about this and talking about that. But as soon as he put his head inside that hall, he went quiet. He didn't speak for about five minutes. And then when I took him out afterwards, he said, Oh, this is good, isn't it? That was his response. Somehow, just the silence, the stillness of the hall, really so sort of took hold of him, and he couldn't speak for that while. There's many times I've seen things like that happen. Even when I was on one of my trips somewhere, somebody brought a, a Feng Shui expert. Apparently, I don't know his name because I wasn't there at the time, but he's you know, one of the experts you know, from, from China. And when he went into that hall, he also confirmed that the front of that hall has some of the strongest Feng Shui he's ever experienced in his life. Very strong. Which is one of the reasons why the stillness, the silence which you generate here, has a huge effect on making it easy for people to meditate. Against that, there are some other places in the world. I remember just going on a pilgrimage once to India, and because it was convenient for the flights, that we landed in Kathmandu, and the first day they insisted on having a tour around Kathmandu. And one of the places we went to see was the old palace. And I do get bored with seeing such worldly things. And I'm also, as many of you know, rebellious. So I wasn't following the group, I went through this doorway into one of these courtyards in that palace and I had some of the worst energy I've ever experienced in my life. And I asked afterwards, what was that? It was very sad, heavy energy. And that was a place where once a year they would do a ceremonial uh, killing of animals, supposedly to give good luck to the kingdom. But the energy in that place was just really bad. And so you can see that places do have energy. And what sometimes that you don't even need to know what happened in the past, but you can feel it's got bad energy. This place seems to be reasonably good energy at the moment, but hopefully we can increase it to make it easier for you to meditate. So please keep quiet and please keep kind as well. The kindness is also helpful. You appreciate what we're doing over here. And you have your good meditations, not so good meditations. But it doesn't really matter because you can always make sure you're kind and caring to other people who are meditating here. There's one weird thing which I've noticed over many years. When everybody is meditating together like this, there are times when one person has a deep meditation, you get very, very peaceful and blissed out. And a lot of other people get the good meditation as well at that time. I don't know how it actually happens, but it's like a resonance. People tune in to the, the deep peace and energy, and you get more deep in your meditation than you've been before. So that's one of the good things about meditating together like this. But of course, in order to be able to have these wonderful meditation experiences, as the Buddha often taught, that when your meditation practice, samadhi, is supported by sila, it's much stronger, more beneficial. Which is one of the reasons why on these retreats, which are more than just one or two days, we like to encourage people to keep the precepts should be able to keep the five precepts at least. And you all know those five precepts, not deliberately killing any living beings, not taking what's not given, not uh, having any sexual misconduct, not lying, and not taking alcohol or non-medicinal drugs. I say non-medicinal drugs because if you're on some medication advised by your doctor, Please carry on taking that medication. 
And if you do need to take some food supplement or something in the evening to make sure that that medication doesn't wreck your tummy, then please you know, make the arrangements with the, the organizers over here to have that little food supplement in the evening. And I say this because even today, when we were talking with the monks, I think at lunchtime, they said how wonderful it was sometimes to be the attendant when we do our interviews. And it reminded me of a story uh, when I was a young monk in UK. And I went to be the attendant of one of the senior monks. And when the people were coming into the room asking all sorts of problems from the senior monk, I was getting more and more bored, more and more tired. And so this one lady came into the room and said, I just come in here not to ask you any questions. I came in here to say thank you for saving my life. And when that, I first heard that, I realized, wow, this was really amazing. Somehow or other, uh, the senior monk had said or done something, and it meant so much to this woman that she came in to say thank you for saving my life. And then I listened intently. And she said that she was on one of these retreats. This was over on the west coast of the north of Scotland. And she said that uh, when she came on that retreat, she didn't pay too much attention. When she heard that the fifth precepts of not taking any alcohol or drugs, she thought that also included the medication which had doctors had prescribed for her for about seven or eight years. What had happened to her was when she was a student at university, she had some difficulties and the doctors uh, prescribed Valium for her. And she'd been taking that Valium for such a long time. And she thought that when you say no drugs, she thought that included that prescription as well. Now, when you're on a retreat, it's usually very peaceful and very uh, supporting. You don't really have too much anxiety. You feel safe. So she managed to be able to cope with not taking her Valium for eight days. But of course, once the retreat was over, she had to go home. And to go home meant taking a bus to Glasgow and going to the railway station to catch her train back to where she lived. And a very busy railway station was full of tension stress, anxiety, and she said she you know, hardly made it onto the train. It was just such a struggle. And when she did got, go home, she said she spent the next, I think, month sitting in her chair, unable to do anything, as she waited for the effects of that drug to wear off. And eventually it did. And she said once she was free of that, what was now an addiction to Valium, she said it was like the cloud had lifted from her mind and she could see and hear and taste and smell things again. So she said now she was alive and she needed to say thank you to the monks. Not that we did anything, but just that she, we managed to encourage her with the means by which you can let things be and allow things to pass and give her life back. And so from that time on, I was always one of the ones who would volunteer to be an upatak, to actually to be with others, senior monks, when they had interviews with people. Because it was so inspiring to see how much these teachings on meditation worked and how they literally did save people's lives. Even just a couple of days ago, the first night, another lady said that to me, thank you for saving my life here in Malaysia. It happens a lot. And I never get used to it. I just value it, how powerful these teachings are. These aren't just something you come here and you just to do because you're a Buddhist. You do because you're a human being. You do suffer difficulties in your life. 
and some of these teachings are so incredibly powerful. They solve problems which psychologists and psychiatrists aren't able to do. The lady who told me that just a day or two ago, uh, she was saying that she's now a psychologist. She did ask permission. Some of your teachings is okay if I use them in, your, in my practice? And of course you can. As long as they work and they help other people, please make use of them. So this is a very powerful meditation practice. The precepts, they help. But re please remember, if it's something which a doctor has prescribed, there's no problem at all. And it's one of the reasons why that old story, even when you go home, and you know, I think many of you are very good Buddhists, every time I come, well, the first time I came through this room here, I looked around, and I saw so many people I've known for years. And it's nice to see you all again. And uh, it's amazing just how many of you are still coming on retreats. I must be a very bad teacher. You, you keep redoing the class year after year after year. But nevertheless, it's nice to see you. And secondly, that this, oh, I think many of you know these old stories, but I started telling it, so here it comes again, about that gentleman who, in Australia, became a Buddhist, and he wanted to keep the five precepts, but sometimes it's difficult to keep the five precepts in modern society. It's especially when it came to this time of the year, you know, it's the Christmas time over in the West, and so that Christmas time that people go to parties, and they go to work events, and you have to go, otherwise that it's like you don't care for your fellow workers. So he was offered you know, the tray of, of drinks, alcohol, and he said, no, 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 I can't take alcohol, I'm a Buddhist. And some people know about Buddhism now, in places like Australia. So the person serving these drinks said, Oh, you're a Buddhist, that's great. Buddhism is all about letting go. Come on, let go and have a drink. <laughs> it didn't work. So anyway, he went home, thought about it, and decided to use another strategy. The next time he went to a party, when people offered him a drink, an alcohol, he said, no, I cannot drink alcohol, doctor's orders. And when he said that, I said, um, yes, very good, you're keeping that fifth precept. But what, <coughs> what about the fourth precept? I'm not lying. <coughs> There's nothing wrong with you. I remember him because he smiled at me. And he was right, I was wrong. It's wonderful when we have these discussions and you teach peace and Buddhism. So that Ajahn Brahm, I thought you should know that many times in the suttas, the Buddha described himself as a doctor. He was Dr. Buddha's orders. <laughs> so that meant he could actually not lie and still make sure that he was understood that he couldn't take any alcohol. So those precepts, those basic precepts, are wonderful things to do. When a person asked me just last night, these precepts, you have to take all these precepts, doesn't that cause you anxiety and stress? Worrying about, are you keeping this precept or that precept? And I said, to me, after 48 years as a monk, these precepts are common sense to me. That's how I look at them. And there's something which is natural. You don't do anything which harms another being or harms yourself. Who would want to harm yourself? Who would want to harm somebody else? So because of that, these precepts are very easy. And if you want to go further, there's no reason why not at a retreat like this, is we uh, increase the five precepts to eight precepts and all that really means is that there's no sexuality at all. And part of that is that you don't wear some jewelry or cosmetics or anything. Just you know you are just who you are. 
as a monk, I don't need to dye my hair because I haven't got any. <laughs> no cosmetics. Uh, so first of all, no sexuality. And we have um, uh, not eating or drinking um, you know, foodstuffs in the afternoon, evening or night time. We only do the eating of food, nutritional stuff, uh, in the morning from dawn until the evening. And all your food is being supplied here, so I'm sure there is plenty for you to eat. In the evening, there's all these loopholes of things which you can eat. And one of the monks was asking me this morning, at cheese, now, can you eat cheese? And this is honest, where I live in Bodhinyana Monastery, we don't allow the monks to eat cheese in the afternoon or evening or night time. But in Jhana Grove Retreat Center, you can eat cheese in the afternoon, evening or night time. So I say, if any of those monks really need some cheese, go walk over to the retreat center and get some over there. <laughs> well, the main thing is, if you really need it, then please take it out of compassion and kindness to your body. So these are things which are on the edge of our Vinaya. So I always say the compassion, if there's a reason for it, then please take it. I don't know what you've got allowed for people down in uh, the areas where you have a cup of tea in the afternoon or evening. There's plenty of stuff which you can put into your tummy to make sure it's more healthy. And look, I've been eating uh, only in the morning in the, uh, for the last 48 years. I've been keeping this rule. And look at me. <laughs> I often tell people if, if I would eat in the evening as well, my goodness, I don't know where my tummy would be. <laughs> like, I like traveling because some time ago, I think the last time I did some traveling, I was going over to USA uh, to uh, do a, it was a conference over in Berkeley. And when I went over there, the, uh, one of the customs officers in one of these U.S. airports, he took one look at my tummy and says, what have you got underneath your robe? Is it a suicide belt? He didn't know what a Buddhist monk is. Have you got a suicide belt? You could have put a suicide belt under the robe. I said, no, it's not a suicide belt, it's fat. And the customs officer said, same thing. <laughs> I laughed. <laughs> That's a great fun with the customs officers. One of them was asking me, this is in Perth Airport, uh, have, what have you got in your bag? You know, have you got any uh, uh, liquids or ointments? Um, I said, no, no. Have you got any hair gel in there? <laughs> and I pointed to my head. <laughs> I said, of course not. And he laughed, I laughed, he let me through. <laughs> so anyway, that we try to make sure we keep things as simple as possible. That's one of the best precepts of simplicity. So not eating in the afternoon or evening or night time. It's just for the sake of simplicity. You get plenty of nutrition inside of you just in the early morning uh, eatings. And it means you've got less to do in the evening. Your tummy is more empty, more energy, and it's easier to meditate. That's what I've found over the years. But again, the precept of not wearing ointments or beautifications. So you see people as they really are. One of the questions I often get asked is how do we adapt these practices when we leave the retreat center and go back to the real world? I said, what are you talking about, real world? In the so-called world, I know people's brothers who've got very grey hair, but they dye their hair. Isn't that correct, Victor? <laughs> Is that real? So it's much more real here when people don't wear adornments or some makeup. As you see them, that's what they are. And it's much less exciting or confronting or scary. So this is the real world. 
And also, we don't distract ourselves with entertainments. The only entertainment you're allowed here is Ajahn Brahm's bad jokes. <laughs> but they're not really entertaining. You get a lot of groans for that. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah, so I think you all know those eight precepts. Do you? You sure? Yeah, that other one is not using um, luxurious furnishings. Like, when I went up to my room, there was a bed in there. And honestly, I just it's okay to just put the mattress on the floor. It's not because the bed was luxurious. It's because I'm always anxious of rolling out of the bed in the morning. And, <laughs> and if it's a high bed, you fall and you might injure yourself. It's much, I always find it much more comfortable sitting on, uh, sitting on a simple seat and also sleeping on the floor. So thank you for those people who helped me take the bed out and just put the mattress on the floor. It's much more comfortable, I've always found in my life. But you don't have to do that. Simple beds are good enough. Simple chairs. Don't use anything luxurious. Keep it simple. That becomes the eight precepts. It's a very simple thing to do. Are you all happy with that? Okay, now I'm supposed to give those three refuges and five precepts, but you know that some very rarely do I do that. You know what the precepts are. So can you all determine the five precepts? You all keep those while you're here? Yeah, so that's good enough. And the eight precepts, for those of you who want to keep the eight precepts, can you do that? That's good. The reason I say that is because sometimes people do take the precepts and they do it formally, they put their hands up and they do the chanting as they're supposed to do it. But I've seen many people doing that. They take the precepts but they don't keep them. That's one of the reasons why on times like uh, Waysak, I've seen many people and they said, how many precepts are you keeping today? And they said, they're keeping 13 precepts. Do you know the 13 precepts? The 13 precepts are you keep eight precepts in the morning and five precepts in the afternoon. <laughs> I think that's missing the point. <laughs> Or another time when I went to Thailand and I saw some people when they were taking the precepts, they put their hands up as they usually do. But then I saw one person <laughs> with one finger down. <laughs> so what are they doing? And they told me, well today I'm only keeping four precepts. He said, well, four is better than none. I said, okay, fair enough. They chanted them all because they didn't want to be embarrassed. But they only put four fingers up. That was a tr kind of a trick. So then I started looking more carefully. Saw so some people with two fingers down. <laughs> some people with four fingers down. They're still doing all the chanting. So just for the sake of simplicity and integrity, it's up to you to keep those precepts as best you can. It's a sign of your wisdom and compassion. And don't make these precepts a burden. Make it like a key to freedom. A nice simplicity of your life. Everyone else, most other people here are keeping precepts. So it makes it easier for you to keep precepts. And it makes it a far more trusting place. Sometimes people can you know, leave expensive things in their rooms or they can drop their wallets or whatever else you have. And because people are kind and trusting, you know that no one will actually steal them and they will let you know where they are afterwards. That's a lovely thing in, say, a monastery. Every now and again somebody drops their wallets in our monastery, somebody finds it and they kind of know if they drop it in a monastery it's going to be there for them whenever they're ready to pick it up. Because the honesty and the care there, not just from the, the monks and the nuns but all the lay people as well, 
is just so firm and uh, trusted that you can leave anything in a monastery. And when you realize you've lost it, bring up a monastery and it'll be there for you. Sometimes even if we're going uh, past your house or place, then the monks will actually almost deliver it for you. Or the Anagarika. It's a nice act of kindness. It's also an act of showing just how trustworthy we all are with these things like precepts. So you don't have to have any anxiety about other people's intentions towards you. It makes it a safe place for you to be. And when it's a safe place, it's much easier to meditate. Please remember when you close your eyes, you don't have any defense or part of your defense is taken away. You don't know who's creeping up behind you, what they're going to do. But when you know that this is a place of eight precepts of Buddhist temple and meditation retreat, you know that people here are going to be so kind to you and caring, looking after you. You don't need to worry about anything at all. People are kind. And when they're kind to you because of the precepts, you can be kind to your own body. Your own body can feel safe. I know that some of you may have some sicknesses and diseases. Look, I'm not wearing a mask. And the reason I don't wear the COVID masks is you know, since the COVID began, I've never had COVID. Other monks have, not me. I have had vaccinations. There's much more than that. For a long time, I've been very aware of my body. And I know when my body feels tired or sick. I've taught this to other people. And of course, I do this myself. Scan my body and know how it feels. And if it feels that there's something going a bit unusual anywhere in my body, if I can feel that it's so easy to heal it, how you heal it is you take away the fear, take away the tension which fear creates, and you do allow your body to heal itself, which it does so amazingly well. Now your body has come from so many generations, experienced so many different things, and your DNA, wherever it's come from, has had so many experiences in dealing with infections, bacteria, and viruses. The trouble is, often our body overreacts. When it overreacts, basically the body is a bit of fear for its viability. If it overreacts, that's where you tense up and that's where you get a lot of sicknesses develop. Sometimes why is it that you know, two or three people are exposed to say COVID? Now one person gets it, the other person doesn't. A lot of the times it's because of how you react. This is what your mind does. And with the training of being a monk, I've said this many times and I'm you know, putting my reputation on the line here. You know, does Ajahn Brahm get COVID? If I did, I'd be a big hypocrite. But I'm so confident about this over so many times, so many years, that you know this is true. When your mind is very still and peaceful, you can overcome so many illnesses, prevent them from happening in the first place. It's one of the reasons why, especially for those people, even here, who may have some cancer, or the beginnings of a cancer, or many, many times they've had a cancer, and it keeps coming back again. Why is it that meditation is one of the, the very powerful treatments which even doctors advise you know, for people with cancers? And it's because it works on your body on a far deeper level 
than doing things like radiation therapy or chemotherapy. This is meditation therapy. And it's very, very powerful. So much so that for years, even during the, uh, the lockdowns, there's a group which I've been teaching in Perth for the last 38 years. And it's in the Cancer Support Association. And we just went past their premises a couple of days ago while I was in Perth. And there's a huge multi-billion dollar premises now. And because our local government, the state government, saw just what benefit it was doing to the local community. And at that time, the Premier of Western Australia, who was a top politician in Western Australia, that was his local electorate. And so he took the opportunity to make sure this organization got a multi-million dollar state grant to upgrade its facilities. And when they did open those facilities, there were two VIPs invited to open the facility. One was the top politician in Western Australia. His name was Colin Barnett. And the other one actually wasn't a VIP, it was a VIM. <laughs> v, very important monk. <laughs> and I was just so touched and honored. Why did you invite me? I'm only a monk. And they said, because you've been coming for 38 years. It's a long time. And they said that you've done such service for this place and all the meditation you've taught. Thank you. And if you've ever been to a Buddhist ceremony in the Thai Theravada tradition, sometimes we do the holy water blessing. And I took great delight, I had to ask the Premier's bodyguards first of all if I could do this, I didn't want them to shoot me. He was an important politician. And so I, I blessed even the Premier as well. Really good fun. So, this is actually the power of this meditation. So, please listen carefully and follow the instructions. You'll have a wonderful time. The other thing which I would say to you is that people go to many meditation retreats here in Malaysia, and some of them look at meditation like something which is you have to endure. Eight days, your legs are going to hurt, your bottom is going to be sore, your back is going to ache, you don't sleep as much as you want to do, and your food, you can't choose what you eat, you have this food and that food you can't eat in the evening, you can't find out what's going on in the television, there's so many things which you can't do, oh, this is terrible. So many of those retreats, I know people... They didn't look forward to retreats at all. It was like an endurance test. And I remember this one gentleman told me, he looked at the meditation hall as the torture chamber. <laughs> and that really kind of disappointed me. So that was where I started calling meditation halls and retreats which I ran I called them Club Med Ampang. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been to Club Medi Mediterranean, whatever. One of my friends did, and I asked him, what do you do there? And they told me all these things. You get up in the morning and you go for pre-dawn swims or diving or something, and you have things to do all day. They said, doesn't that wear you out? I said, oh yes, we get exhausted after our holidays. <laughs> so what are you doing that for? It's crazy. You have to pay much more money than I'm sure you paid to come on this retreat. And you get far more benefits from this retreat than you'll ever get in any club Mediterranean resort. Here is more peaceful, more therapeutic, and just more peaceful, and more insight, and more health. I can go on with so many stories, but 
I remember this one lady who came from Sydney to Perth for one of the retreats, and she said she had to beg and grovel to her boss to get the time off. Uh, but she came, and when she went back to work on a Monday morning in Sydney, she was an executive. Her boss took one look at her. She wrote me this email. said, my boss took one look at me and said, what drug is Ajahn Brahm giving to you? You look so happy and blissed out. I don't care what it is, but please next time you get him to send some back to me as well. In other words, they saw the result of just you know, eight or nine days meditation. Just how peaceful you become, how joyful you become, which is why this is Club Med. A thing to look forward to, a thing to enjoy. There's so much happiness and peace like you've never seen before. So anyway, that's just an introduction. Again, the first day is just settling in. And I should actually tell you that there is a schedule, but please don't keep it. <laughs> in other words, if you feel tired, please take a rest. The reason I say that is because if you force yourself, especially in the first few days of a retreat, you, you waste time. You get so tense. So if you feel tired, that's what your beds are for. So take a rest. But when you come back, when you feel good, you feel energized, then start meditating, you have a very easier time to get peaceful. After a while, the sleepiness disappears by itself. And I said don't keep the schedule because I think you're supposed to get the first meditation of the schedule is at 6 o'clock or 5.30? 6 o'clock. So please don't keep that schedule. You're allowed to come at 5. <laughs> in other words, if you've got energy when you get up in the morning, come and do some meditation. Why not? And if in the evening you feel really energized, then just carry on sitting here. Why not? And you can always catch up on the sleep another time of the day. All these talks are recorded, so you won't miss any. And I guarantee you don't have to set your alarm to know when breakfast is. <laughs> Nobody misses breakfast. So, keep it easy. This is not a school where if you don't come on time, you have to meditate in the corner. <laughs> so, keep it easy, keep it fun, and have the time of your life on this retreat. Sad and sad and sad. Sad and sad and sad.